So uh, let's uh, read with me. Let's go back over all of our therefore statements. So read these with me. Let's start with the first one here. God is faithful, therefore I have faith. Because God always has come through, I can trust him to come through in the future. Amen? Amen. All right, that's the first point. Let's read the second one. God is right, therefore I obey. Let's test something. If I disagree with God's word, who's wrong? I am. That's exactly right. So God is always right, therefore I need to always obey. Amen? Amen. That's a tougher one, but, you know, we got to learn stuff. Let's keep going. Third one. God is enough, therefore I am content. God will always provide me what I need, right? So God is enough, therefore I'm content. Let's keep reading. God is kind, therefore I am compassionate. You guys get that? You have lived that out. We prayed, I don't know if you thought about this, but we prayed last week for opportunities to show God's compassion to the world around us. God gave us those opportunities and you came through. I've just talked to you about the public ones that all of us came through on. I don't even know about the individual moments of compassion that many of you have lived out this week because God opened those doors. That's what God called us to do. Now this week, we're going to deal with the next therefore statement in our list. So read this one with me. God is the blesser, therefore I am blessed. You can't read it, it's not up there. There it is, now let's read it. God is the blesser, therefore I am blessed. Is the word blesser a real word? I don't know, but we're going to use it today, all right? So for today, for new life purposes today, blesser is a word and is in the dictionary. I have not checked to see if it's actually there. doesn't matter. God is the blesser, therefore I am blessed. Now, a lot of you kind of wonder about me, and I, I, kind, of, I kind of freak you out. Some of you I tick off because I come against this name and claim it stuff so often. Let, let me say something in, in, in light of that. Let me, let me be clear about something, and I want you to hear what I'm going to say. The God of heaven intends to bless his people, all right? God wants to, desires to, loves to bless you, especially when you obey him, especially when you are content in him, especially when you have faith in him, especially when you show his compassion. God intends to bless his people. Let me give you an example. Last week, we started the soft launch of, of Healing Place Church. Last week, 250 people from this church attended church up at, up at, uh, up at the Waldorf JCs. That church has launched. Look around you today. This is just God showing off this morning. Because 250 or more of us are going to gather at Waldorf JC's for Healing Place Church, and yet we hardly have a chair left in this room. God is always blessing His people. God always wants to bless His people. The problem is, we too narrowly define this term blessing. You need to understand that. We define the term blessed in too narrow a scope. You see, to Americans, blessings always come in green. You understand that? To Americans, blessed is always something to do with money. And that's just too narrow a definition of blessing. And when I come against movements like like name and claim it movements, I'm coming against that because the definition of blessing is too narrow. Now, will God bless us from time to time in the color green? Absolutely. Absolutely. But that is too narrow a definition. In fact, you need to understand that if we are to give a definition of the blessing of God, we are by definition saying what our theology is, our understanding of God is. Now, you must understand something about defining theology. If we are going to define our belief or our science of God, it must be something that is true at all times, in all places, for all people, in all circumstances. If, if, if we say something about God that is not true in all times, in all places, for all people, in all circumstances, we are incorrect in our definition of God. Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God is the same for every individual on this planet. Therefore, if we define the blessing of God, it must be defined broadly enough 
that it works for every human being that does or ever has existed on the face of this planet. Does that make sense to you? It's very simple. Our definition of blessing must be broad enough to encompass a God who is all things for all people at all times. We must have a definition of blessing that is that broad. So how do we do that? How do we begin to define that? Well, I want to do that today, and I want to do that from the same character we talked about last week. Y'all remember him, right? His name is Mephibosheth. Everybody loves the name Mephibosheth. All right, you just, you just look at your neighbor just because it's fun to do it and say, Mephibosheth. <laughs> Isn't it just fun to say that word? Some of y'all are going, bah, 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 bah. <laughs> People speaking in tongues up in the Wesleyan church this morning. <laughs> you know, because you can't say Mephibosheth. All right, if you want to, I actually know a man named Mephibosheth. He is in Guatemala. We do not call him Mephibosheth. We call him Mephi. So today, we will call Mephibosheth Mephi, because it's easier for everybody, all right? So, so the story of Mephibosheth that we went into last week came to us from 2 Samuel chapter 9. If you'll remember, David had just taken over the overall throne of Israel. He now had all of Israel under him, and he showed the compassion of God to Mephibosheth as the new king of all Israel. This is the beginning of David's reign. By the time we get to chapter 19, we are at the end of David's reign. And an awful lot of things have changed. You see, over all the years that David is king, much changes about who David is, and much changes about how David relates to his kingdom. Now, in order for me to not spend all of my time walking you through the life of David, let me, let me sum it up this way. David was always an excellent king. David was almost never an excellent husband and father. He was good at his job, and he was particularly bad at home. And it wasn't that he was evil to his family. It wasn't that he was difficult to his family. It just seems that he did not put the focus on the family that he should have. And across, many of you, you remember the name Solomon. And of course, Solomon turned out all right. But, but, but to be honest, most of the rest of David's children, it just didn't turn out all that well. It just wasn't that great. He, he was not a great father. He was not a great husband. He just didn't do all that well in the house. One story in particular that brings us to the account we're going to deal with today is a son by the name of Absalom. And Absalom begins to believe that he would be a better king than his father, David. And he begins to put together a plan to take over the kingdom. To make a long story short, his plan works. And he takes over the kingdom. He is ruling Israel from Jerusalem. Mostly because King David refuses to fight him. Now, I would like to come against David and say, you, you didn't care enough about your kingdom. You're more worried about your son Absalom than you are the kingdom. Joab, his, the ruler of his army, the leader of his army, did say this to David. And, and I, would, you know, I would like to agree with Joab, and from a mental state, I agree. You should have been a better king at this moment. But as a father, i got to tell you, I don't know that I wouldn't have reacted very much like David did. I, I don't know what God would have done in my heart at that moment. But David wouldn't fight, so Absalom took over. And Absalom was an evil man. Absalom did evil in the eyes of God from the very beginning. And so David's armies turn, even without the king's support, and fight Absalom. And a hesitant king allows his armies to retake his nation from his own son to the point that eventually Absalom is killed. And David goes into mourning. And Joab tells him off and says, get up and walk out there and lead these men back home or by the time the sun goes down, you will have no one left. It gets that bad. And David realizes that Joab is right. And he gets up and he starts the journey home. 
That brings us to chapter 19. And in chapter 19, we run into Methy again. Oh, you see what happened was, when David's leaving Jerusalem, you remember Ziba? He's the guy that's supposed to take care of Methy. Ziba's supposed to take care of all the stuff that belongs to Methy. Ziba comes to David and, and, and brings all these donkeys and all these provisions. And David says, what's this for? And he says, it's for the king and his men. David says, well, where's Mephi? And Ziba says, well, Mephi stayed back home. He believes they're going to make him king since you're gone. Ooh. So David says, fine. Everything that was Mephi's is now yours. Which brings us to our first point. All these folks on his way back to Jerusalem begin to come back up to King David and try to make things right with the returning king. One of the ones who come up to him is Mephibosheth. Read this with me. Mephibosheth, Saul's grandson, also went down to meet the king. He had not taken care of his feet or trimmed his mustache or washed his clothes from the day the king left until the day he returned safely. Now remember, everything Mephi has has now been given away to Ziba by the king. Which brings us to this point that I need you to understand as we try to define the word blessing. Stuff tends to disappear. You need to remember that. You need to know that. Stuff tends to disappear. You say, Pastor Mike, what are you talking about? Well, listen, a lot of us define blessing by how much stuff we have. And if we have a lot of stuff, we're really blessed. And in the beginning of the story, Mephi has a lot of stuff. By the time we get to this verse, verse 24 in chapter 19, in literally, Mephi has nothing. And you need to understand that the same thing happens in our lives. Stuff tends to disappear. Have you ever noticed that? And with stuff, I would throw money itself into the category of stuff. Have you ever noticed that there are times in your life when money seems to run away from you faster than it's running toward you? You ever noticed that? Have you ever noticed that sometimes your stuff seems to be running away from you faster than it's running towards you? Folks, some people want to put their hope and their trust and their faith in their stuff or their money. But friends, that is a weak, a, 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 an unreliable place to put your hopes and your dreams and your future. Because your stuff tends to disappear. People steal your stuff. The government takes your stuff. It's not stealing to them. I mean, uh, disasters wipe out your stuff. Economic tragedy d diminishes the value of your stuff. Uh, a tornado blows your stuff to Delaware. A hurricane puts your stuff underwater. All of a sudden, a lack of a job all of a sudden drains all the stuff you have. Sometimes the stuff itself betrays you. You buy what you think is the right stuff, but it ain't the right stuff. And all of a sudden, you got stuff that is the wrong stuff, and your stuff don't do nothing for you. Sometimes you got the right stuff, and it breaks down. And you used to have good stuff, and now all you got is broke stuff. Sometimes your stuff just gets old, and you, have to, you used to have stuff you liked, and now you just got stuff you're tired of. Stuff is not the answer. It's not what's going to carry you through. Your stuff, in one way or another, tends to disappear. Now, I want to say something. Everybody listen to me. The fact God gives us stuff, the fact God gives us money, is a blessing. Okay, it is. I'm not, I'm not saying it's not a blessing. I'm just saying it's too narrow a definition of blessing for us to focus just there. Because there's an awful lot of people who got no stuff, but are really blessed. In fact, can I tell you, sometimes the fact that God gives us extra stuff is a blessing 
Because he allows us the ability to be a blessing to folks who have somehow lost their stuff. Yesterday's a great example. Three hours. Three hours. And you had enough extra stuff to be able to go out and buy 2,000 cases of water and get them here at last minute with no warning and get it done in three hours and even bring in the trailers and the trucks. and all. Look, we didn't own any of that stuff. Well, we owned one trailer. We had to leave all the youth stuff in a, I don't know, we put it on the yard out there. I don't know what we do with it. I don't know. It's gone. Don't tell Brian. Sometimes the stuff is helpful, but it's too narrow a definition. Read this next one with me. Let's read this. Let's read this together. He's, oh, by the way, he is, is messy here. Okay, here we go. He said, my Lord, the king, since I, your servant, am lame, I said, I will have my donkey saddled and will ride on it so I can go with the king. But Ziba, my servant, betrayed me. And he has slandered your servant to my Lord, the king. My Lord, the king is like an angel of God. So do whatever pleases you. Here's the story. Ziba tells David that, that, that Mephi stays behind because he thinks he's going to be king. Now, Mephi tells David, no, Ziba told me not to go because I didn't need to. And then without me, he went with all the provisions that I told him to send. And then he slandered me to you. Time out. Sidebar, nothing to do with the sermon. Just want to point something out. Who's telling the truth? I got to be honest with you. Scripturally, we don't really know. We don't really know. You would say, well, Mephi's telling the truth. And, and, and I'm going to show you an instance here in a minute that, that would seem to argue for Mephibosheth telling the truth. Some of you say, well, he has to be telling the truth because he was very discouraged and pressed. He didn't like take care of his feet or he didn't wash or he didn't do any of that. I don't know. Maybe he's just trying to make a show of it. In the end, you know what David does? David says, fine, Ziba, you take half the stuff. Mephibosheth, you take the other half, which is kind of like David saying, I don't know who's telling me the truth. But it doesn't matter. I tend to think Mephibosheth is telling the truth. So let's work from that perspective today, okay? I can't defend that really, but let's work from that perspective. Mephibosheth is telling the truth, and therefore Ziba has betrayed him. Ziba has unfairly slandered him to the king. So here's the second point. Not only do you need to know that stuff tends to disappear, you need to know, and here's the second place we usually put our definition of blessing, you need to remember that people tend to disappoint. You need to realize that. Now, everybody calm down. Everybody calm down. Just control yourself. People are a blessing from God. Amen? The people around us are a real blessing. Everybody needs to understand that. But the stuff around us is a real blessing. All of those things are real blessings, but we cannot define blessing too narrowly. And if we define blessing as simply being the people around us are a blessing, which is the way we say things. You know how we always say things, we're trying to be nice to each other. We say, well, God will provide, and we're talking about the stuff. And then we say, oh, but you have friends. And we're talking about the people, and we're trying to make each other feel better. And while there's truth in both of those statements, sometimes both of those statements fall flat because they're not enough. We can't just say that people are evidence of God's blessing because if, the, if we say that, what will we do with folks who don't have folks around them? Are they just not blessed? Can we argue that somehow someone that just doesn't have a large group of people around them or a close group of people around them, God just doesn't care about them and he hasn't blessed them? I don't believe that. I don't think that's true. And anyway, just like stuff tends to disappear, people tend to disappoint. Even somebody that cares about you will disappoint you, maybe not even on purpose. Sometimes people disappoint us and they mean to. Usually people disappoint us and they don't mean to. But in the end, we have to understand that just like stuff tends to disappear, people tend to disappoint. I mean, have you ever had that happen? 
Have you ever had somebody that you really thought was close to you suddenly kind of like, you know, stab you in the back? Yeah, don't be talk, don't call a name. Don't elbow the person beside you. But that happens. All of a sudden, the people around us tend to disappoint. You know why they do that? I'm going to tell you a secret. They do that because they're human. Humans tend to disappoint other humans. And they tend to do it on a regular basis. Some of you are going, oh, but Pastor Mike, you've never disappointed me. Give me time. <laughs> It'll happen. You know? Look, 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 the truth is that we can't limit our definition of blessing either to stuff or to people. Time out. Stuff is a blessing when God gives it. People are a blessing. But they are not a broad enough, either one of them, even the two together, a broad enough definition of what it means to be blessed. And if we are to truly understand God's blessing, we cannot limit it to people and we cannot limit it to money and things. Now, King David looks at Mephi and says, Mephi, tell you what. I'll give half of everything you own to Ziba because you guys are obviously not getting along right now. I'll give half of it to Ziba and I'll give half of it to you. And that's where we get our last reading. Read this with me. Mephibosheth said to the king, let him take everything now that my lord the king has arrived home safely. Stuff tends to disappear. And people tend to disappoint. But I am here today to tell you in no uncertain terms that the king is eternal. Y'all saw me make a turn there, right? I'm not talking about David anymore. I'm talking about the king of heaven. I'm talking about God. I'm talking about the king of heaven whom David in an earthly sense represents at this moment. The king of heaven is eternal. He does not disappear like our stuff. He does not disappoint like our people. The king of heaven is eternal and he is always faithful. Remember that one? And he is always right. Remember that one? And he is always enough. Remember that one? And he is always kind. And when I know all of those things about him and then I realize that the God who is all those things also is my blesser. I begin to realize something that Mephibosheth came to understand. Everything I need, all I need is at his table. Everything I need is at the table of the king. And that's what Mephibosheth is saying. Father, as long as I can sit at your table, I'll have all I need. You are all I need. Oh, wait a minute. Throw that back up there for me. Let me show you what this does not say. This does not say all I want is at the king's table. You know why? Because I tend to want a lot of things that I don't need. See, the fact you could bring in 2,000 cases of water yesterday and three out with three hours notice tells me that you have a little bit of disposable income. And you know what we learn about people when we have, they have disposable income? We learn what they want that they don't actually need. Like ice cream. <laughs> How many of you would love to have some ice cream right now? See? See? Ice cream places popping up on every corner in La Plata, and ain't one of them empty. We go out and get us some ice cream. But we don't need it. Okay, let's pick on me. I picked on you. Let's pick on me. I daily desire pizza. <laughs> I do. 
run down to Uzo's and grab me some pizza every day I would and I'd be you'd, you'd have man you'd have you would have a pastor expanding his horizons on a weekly basis <laughs> I mean pizza is my comfort food if y'all see me hanging out down at Uzo's ordering pizzas every other day or something you better don't look you better just call me a therapist it means I'm depressed because that's what I do when I'm depressed I go get me a pizza a pizza makes everything better <laughs> how many of y'all know what I'm talking about oh yeah oh yeah I do not need pizza I need a salad <laughs> I never desire a salad I don't remember ever once waking up and saying Lord I wish you'd have made me a rabbit And if I do have a salad, I want all that. you got to put fat on my salad. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that ranch stuff, you know. <laughs> salad is nothing in the world but a vehicle to eat mayonnaise that's flavored. <laughs> Does not say all I want is at the king's table. It says all I need is at the king's table. Because he is enough. And my relationship with him is what ultimately matters. My relationship with the eternal king of heaven is in the end the only thing that will matter. About five weeks ago, my mom called me. And she said, Michael, my stepdad, Gray, They've diagnosed Gray with, um, with leukemia. And it's pretty aggressive. So I just need you to know that that's coming. Well, things progressed pretty quickly. And last Sunday, Tina and I finished up the services here, went home, made lunch, and headed down to Mama's house. And I, we got there about 11 o'clock. And my sister had been there with them up to that point. She went home to get some sleep, and I stayed with Mom, and we sat up. Mom and I sat up with Dad till about 4.30. Until Mom said, Michael, I've got to get some sleep. So she laid down there beside him. And um, he was struggling a great deal by that point. And I walked just in the next room and laid down on the couch. About two hours later, Mom woke me up. said, Michael... Grace gone. And so Monday morning at about, probably about 5, 5.30, my stepdad passed away. Some of y'all are going, why didn't you tell us? We could have been praying for you. Listen, that's my fault. Blame me. I needed to focus on mom, and with all due respect, I needed to focus on her and not feel the thousand phone calls. Her phone blew up, and I needed to help her through that. So I'm letting you know now. On Monday, the man who has been my father since I was six years old passed away. He's a good man. And um, he taught me a great deal over my life. And um, he passed quietly. Mom said, I, I, I wish I had been awake when he passed. I said, you know what, Mama? If I get to go home to Jesus laying in the bed next to Tina, it's all good. She said, okay. You see, I don't know, 25, 30 years ago, we had a pastor that hurt our family very badly, and I've told you this story before. And my stepdad refused to go to church after that. We always wondered about his faith, and we would ask him from time to time, but my stepdad's not. He didn't talk much. He's one of those country boys that died about a half a mile from where he was born. Just as steady as the day is long. But in the last few months, we've been able to have that conversation with him. And he clearly told us that he was ready to go. And what we learned in the last few months was that he had lost faith in the church, not in God. 
Can I tell you what we didn't talk about? We visited him a couple weeks ago. We didn't talk about his stuff. It didn't matter. Now, my daddy's an old country boy, so in his basement, good Lord, he's got some stuff. <laughs> he's got nuts and bolts that don't go together. The prob- he probably got a 1,000 pounds of nuts and bolts that don't go together. You know those folks? They just never threw anything away. <laughs> Y'all, I'm going to have to be gone for like six months just to clean out this man's basement. You know what I'm saying? It's going to take forever. But we didn't talk about his stuff. You know what we didn't talk about? We didn't talk about those people that had disappointed him. And in that last moment, it wasn't about anything else except knowing beyond the shadow of any doubt that his soul was right. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. It's a blessing that he had a house that was warm and heated and there was stuff around him that was, that was familiar. That was a blessing. Everybody got that? Don't get me wrong. The fact that mom stayed by his side the whole way through and the fact that Michelle and I were there and all of his children came in to visit him. Don't get me wrong. That was a blessing. But in the end, the blessing that matters is the fact that he knew the God who was going to carry him from that place to his eternal place. And I'm here to tell you that at the king's table is all the blessing you need. That's what we got to know. And then, y'all, can can I go plum southern on you? I've been in the south. They're already picking on me because my accent's bad. (laughs) Can I just go straight southern on you? If we know Jesus, all the rest of it's just gravy. You know? And in the South, you can make gravy out of anything. (laughs) Y'all know what I'm talking about? Because what matters is that we know the God of heaven. He is our blessing. So don't, don't hear the sermon wrong. Don't hear he's our blesser, so I am blessed, so I should have a Mercedes. That ain't good theology. And don't hear me say God is enough, so I should never expect anything else in my life. I don't even think that's good theology either. But live in a tension that says stuff is good. People are important. But God's what matters. If I can live in that tension... I can find a blessing that is not dependent on my stuff or the people, but is completely anchored in a God that is more than sufficient. Father, I thank you and I praise you. I praise you tonight for Gray Goodman. I praise you for his life. I praise you for a man who played dad to me when he didn't have to. And I praise you for a good example. But today, Lord, I praise you most for yourself. You are enough. You are kind. You are faithful. You are all-knowing and always right. You are our God. And you are our blesser. And to be quite honest, Lord, you are also our blessing. We could never do anything to earn your presence. We could never do anything to earn your hope. We could never do anything to earn the privilege of being seated at your table. And yet you provide that. And Lord, when we begin to remember that you are our blessing, we begin to realize that we serve a God who is more and who is stronger than any opposition we might face. And when our stuff disappears, 
we still have our God. And when people disappoint us, we still have our God. And though the world would offer us everything we could ever imagine, we would say with Mephibosheth, let them have it as long as I have the presence of the King. And in your presence, whatever you send us, we will praise you for. We will praise you for enough extra that we could in three hours buy 2,000 cases of water and send them to other people. I praise you that you gave us enough extra to do that. We praise you for the people around us Oh, most of us would curl up in a corner and just die without them. And so we praise you, Lord, for them. I praise you for every human being around me. And Lord, everyone in this room does the same. But dear Lord, in the end, let us see our blessing properly. Let us understand that at the core of being blessed is the privilege of being in the presence of the God of heaven. Let us account you as sufficient and all else is gravy. And then teach us, Lord, to make gravy out of anything. You are more. You are stronger. You, dear Lord, are enough. And we praise you for being our blesser and giving us your blessing. In your name we pray. Amen.